Granny by Anthony Horowitz Prologue, Heathrow Airport The storm broke early in the evening and by seven o'clock it looked as if Heathrow might have to shut down. Runway 1 had disappeared in the rain. Runway 2 was a canal. Half the planes had been delayed and the other half were circling hopelessly above the clouds, waiting their turn to land. The wind had blown an Air France DC-10 all the way to Luton, while, in a jumbo jet from Tokyo, 79 Japanese passengers had all been sick at the same time. It was a night no one would forget. The green Mercedes reached the airport at exactly half past seven, skidding round a corner and spraying water over two traffic wardens, a porter and a visitor from Norway. Swerving across the road, it missed a taxi by inches and rocketed into the car park of ter Terminal 3. The electric side window slid down and a hand with a signet ring and the initials GW, entwined in gold, reached out to pluck a parking ticket from the machine. Then the car jumped forward again, shot up three ramps with the tyres screaming and crashed into a wall. Ten thousand pounds worth of metal and paintwork crumpled in on itself. The engine died. Steam hissed from beneath the bent and broken bonnet. The doors of the car opened and three people got out. The driver was a short, bold man. Next to him was a woman in a fur coat. The back seat had been occupied by a 12-year-old boy. You told me to park on the fourth floor, the man screamed. The fourth floor. Yes, Gordon, the woman muttered. But this car park's only got three floors, the man moaned. He pointed at the wreck of his car. And now look what's happened. Oh, Gordon, the woman's lips quivered. For a moment she looked terrified, then she blinked. Does it really matter? she asked. The man stared at her. You're right, he exclaimed. He laughed out loud. It doesn't matter at all. We're leaving the car here. We'll never see it again. The woman and the man rushed into each other's arms, kissed each other and then grabbed their luggage, which the boy had meanwhile taken out of the boot. They had only two suitcases be between them and these looked as if they had been packed in a hurry. Part of a pink silk tie a striped pyjama leg and a frilly shower cap were po poking out of one side. Come on, the man exclaimed. Let's go. But just then there was a flash of lightning and an explosion of thunder and the three of them froze alone in the middle of the dimly lit car park. A plane roared past overhead. Oh, Gordon, the woman whimpered. It's all right, Gordon snapped. She's not here. Keep your hair on. We're going to be all right. I'd keep my hair on except I packed it. Come on, we've got to get to the tickets, the boy said, and without waiting for his parents, he began to walk towards the lifts. Ten minutes later, the family was queuing up at the British Airways ticket desk. After the darkness of the storm, the building was unnaturally bright, like a television set with the colour turned up too much. There were people everywhere, milling around with their suitcases and carrier bags. A policeman with a machine gun patrolled the area. He was the only person smiling. Good evening, sir. The man at the ticket desk was in his early twenties with close-cropped hair and tired eyes. He had his name, Owen, on a badge on his chest, but in his tiredness he had pinned it upside down. Can I help you? You certainly can, Nemo, the man said, squinting at the badge. I want three flights. Three flights, sir? Owen coughed. He had never seen such nervous-looking passengers. They all looked as if they had just come off the worst fairground ride in the world. Where to? he asked. America, the man replied. Africa, the woman said at the same moment. Australia, the boy exclaimed. Anywhere, the man said, just so long as it leaves soon. And it's got to be far away, the woman added. Well, sir, Owen swallowed. It would help if you actually knew where you wanted to go. The man leaned forward, his eyes wild and staring. They weren't staring in quite the same direction, which made him look even more wild. His clothes were, were expensive, tailor-made, but the ticket salesman couldn't help noticing that he had dressed in a hurry. His tie was crooked and, more surprisingly, on the wrong side of his neck. I just want to go away, the man hissed, before she gets here. The woman burst into tears and tried to hide her face in the mink coat. The boy began to tremble. The ticket seller's eyes flickered to the computer screen in front of him. The computer screen flickered back. How about the nine o'clock flight to Perth, he suggested. Scotland, 
the man screamed the words so loudly that several passengers turned to look at him and the policeman dropped his machine gun. Australia, the ticket seller said. Perfect, the man exclaimed. He snapped a gold visa card onto the counter. We'll have two tickets first class and one in tourist for the boy. Ow! The man cried out as his wife's elbow caught him on the side of his head. All right, he said, rubbing a red mark above his eye. We'll all go first class together. Certainly, sir, the ticket seller picked up the credit card. Mr Gordon Warden. Yes, that's me. And the child's name? Jordan Warden. Jordan Warden, the ticket seller tapped into the name, the name into the computer. And your wife? Maud N. Warden, the woman said. Gordon Warden, Jordan Warden, Morden Warden, right? He tapped some more buttons and waited as the machine spat out three tickets. Check in at desk 11 and it'll be gate 6 for Borden, Mr Warden. Five hours later, British Airways Flight 777 took off for Perth in Western Australia. As the plane reached the end of the runway and lurched upwards into the swirling night and rain, Gordon Warden and his wife sank back into their first class seats. Mr Warden began to giggle. We've done it, he said in a quivering voice. We've beaten her. How do you know she's not on the plane? His wife asked. Mr Warden sat bolt upright. Stewardess, he called, bring me a parachute. Just across.